You know, in 2 Corinthians, we were studying the last month about as we all are beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. When we read the Bible, we are our first exposure to glory. We're, we're believing. How many of you believe that when it's written down that it was a record of an action that took place on this earth? It was words that were orchestrated not from man but from God by the Holy Spirit. We believe that, right? So it says that we, when we're seeing this Word of God, we're, we're beholding like looking in a glass, the mirror, a mirror, glass, the glory of the Lord, how God interacted with mankind. What an awesome thing. And then it says, and we are changed into the same image from glory to glory. So there's an image here. There's something here that's not just words on a page. It's not just subject to an imagination. This happened. This is reality. This is what it looks like. This is the, the length, the breadth, the depth, and the height. This is the, the picture of it, of God's will. Amen? And he says, and we are changed into the same image. Boy, that, that just tells me that God has planned a life for you and I that not only makes him necessary, but it's going to be awesome as we mature in our faith. And that's kind of what we're talking about today, that maturing process. We also talked about... Uh, some other scriptures we talked about in the last month about John chapter 1 where Jesus was recorded as, or John recorded saying that as many as received Jesus to them he gave power which is authority to become the sons of God so we have been authorized to become something there's a process there and that's how faith interacts that's how we get to in, into that glory to glory process and then we studied about the potter, how the father's will, the father being the type of the potter in, in Jeremiah, and, and how God doesn't throw away the clay when the clay becomes deformed or doesn't present that image just right. God says, we've just got more work to do. Amen? So grace of God just amazes me, just amazing. So we've studied that in the last month, and we're going to kind of continue and launch off of that. Continuing to do our study on what the redeemed life looks like. Redeemed is what God did for us in Christ. You know, our theme scripture for this whole year has been Galatians 3.13, that Christ hath redeemed us. So that tells us the work's already done. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse by being made a curse for us that the blessing of Abraham might come upon our lives. Now, Abraham was the type and shadow of a man of faith, all right? And God had blessed Abraham in every aspect, every area of his life from the time that he accepted the covenant of God until he died. It was written in the scripture that Abraham was an image. It was something that God had showed the world of what his blessings looked like. And so there was not one area. If you would have lived in Abraham's day, you wouldn't have found one thing in his life that did not bespeak of God's blessing. And yet Abraham was a man with fault, a man that had failures. But thank God for the message of grace and the potter. And Christ redeemed us from the curse so that those same type blessings would be experienced in our life. Why? Why does God want me blessed? So that it will show the world who our God is. That he is greater than the enemy. He's greater than any weapon that has ever been formed in the crucible of time. He just cannot match what God can do in a person's life. Christ redeemed us so we could live that way. Now, when you think about Christ, who has done the work of redemption, you have to understand, the, the curse, when Jesus walked this earth, how many of you know, or at least think, that the earth was in retrieval? It was in chaos. It was, it was, the curse was running rampant. How many of you believe it was? All right, I'm, I'm asking these questions for a reason, and we'll get to it in a minute. How many of you believe that Jesus had to deal with demons? Well, we believe that because we read it in Scripture. How many of you believe that Jesus himself dealt one-on-one -on -one personally with the devil? Three temptations in the wilderness. That's really all that was recorded about, about that confrontation. It, once it was over, it was over. So what am I leading up to? I'm trying to tell you that everything that God has manifested in the past, Everything has eternal value. What does eternal value mean? It means that it's never-ending. 
Once it was established, once it was shown forth, once that there was something pinned by the Holy Spirit through the hand of man, once it was recorded, what God wanted recorded, that has eternal value, and that means that it'll never pass away. It's as true today as it ever has been. Why? Because God wants to bring it to pass in our generation. Because we are in Christ. We are the, called the body of Christ. How many of you know that? The body of Christ, that's the church. Christ dwells in the body, not just in us individually, although that is true when we have faith, but it's in the body. It's all about the body with God. It's all about showing the world who Jesus Christ is, that he's not 2,000 years gone and, and all we have is memories and an epitaph and, you know, and, and a little dash between when he was born and when he died. That's not what the point is. God wants to show the world that he's still alive, and he does that through his body called the church. And the church has to learn to live the redeemed life. So what does that mean? How do you, let me ask you another question. How do you measure the curse? You can measure it by your own experience, but I guarantee you not one person here has ever experienced the full impact of the curse. There's a lot of things that, that the curse would like to have happen in your life that hasn't happened. Thank God for grace. You can't define or measure the curse by your own experience. You can't do it because you can't get the fullness of it. You can only get a glimpse of it. So the curse is just simply the curse. Now we can observe, we can see, we can reckon, we can, we can assess and line up and say, well, you know, I mean, those bad things. How many of you believe that, that God doesn't do anything bad? Let me ask you that. They're not in him. God is not a bad, he doesn't have bad, he cannot do bad or evil he cannot he allows it because there's another source another spiritual source that's that's propagating evil and bad and Jesus came right in the midst of it you know the Bible tells us that in the fullness of time God sent forth his only begotten son now why would he say a statement like that because God said okay I'm going to allow the devil to do everything he can to propagate the fullness of the curse. And then I'm going to send my son, and he's going to show my people what it looks like as a son. As a one that, that is not going to be affected, but the one that's going to affect the curse, going to push the curse out of people's lives. Because the curse never got involved in his life. How many of you believe that Jesus operated absolutely above and beyond the curse? The curse was never manifested in him. Not one time. you believe that? Yes. So what the church needs to understand, what we're trying to get across is the message today, the sons of God, we're going to boil it down into no man's land because I've been teaching on that on Wednesday nights, but I want, I want our Sunday morning group to hear it too. But living the redeemed life is learning to mature into the place where we become sons of God. Now, when you get born again, you're called a child of God. How many of you know that that's a designation that gives us understanding a child is immature? Our children have to learn. They have to learn. Now, they can learn the hard way. They can be undisciplined. You know, they can, be, they can let their, their, their life, you know, you know, be subject to, you know, kind of testing things out. And, you know. But once you get mature, like Paul said, he said, look, when I became a man, I put away childish things. That's called sonship. Now, sons is not a designation of gender where it means that the sons of God are just the, it's not just the men. It, it involves men and or women. It's a designated, it's a covenant statement of designating that it's a mature level in your faith. And that's what we need to get to in order to see that our lives can be, be that body of Christ where we are showing the world who Jesus Christ is, not by our words and our theology, but by our lives. That they can look at, they can observe, they can see it, amen? And so that's what, kind of what we're talking about today, we're dealing with this. Now, <laughs> you know, I remember uh, watching a, a show one time, I don't remember, I'm not quite sure what the name of it was, but you know, it was, it was this, this guy and he was out to, to bring vengeance basically because of something wrong, something evil had happened. And the enemy, of course, was man and as far as he knew because it was a movie, you know, what this show. And, uh, and I like those action shows, man. You know, Jody always tries to get me to watch those chick flicks. 
Well, I've told you, man. I mean, I, you know, there was that one in particular. I'll never forget, man. I mean, you was at the women's con- marriage conference. You heard me tell it. But, I mean, we watched that one called The Notebook. Guys, have your wives ever made you watch The Notebook? <laughs> oh, man. Well, you know, around here, it was just, it was clearly, a, 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 it was something that you had to, you know, you had to show your, your, your soft side as a man, you know. And so, because everybody was talking around the staff. Jody says I exaggerate, but I'm telling you, this is just how I heard it. Just got to say, and man, it was somebody, oh, I, I saw it, and it's like, oh, I, I cried so loud, so loud, oh, I just hear that, you know, so it was like a contest to see who could outcry the other one. You know, like, oh, no, you, you cried, look, 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 man, I had tears coming down my face, man, I'm telling you, they, I had to get a towel to keep myself dry. You know, and even men, oh, and my husband, oh, he just, he was just, I'm like, oh, here's the test, man, so we got to watch it. So I, I'm under pressure. I got to cry. <laughs> I don't know when. I got to pick my moment. I am trying my best. I am my, I'm watching the show and my mind is on, I wonder what they're doing at, at the lake. I wonder what's happening over here. That, and I'm trying, man. I'm really trying to soak it in because I know the moment's coming. And, you know, I'm watching Jody and she's not crying yet, you know. And so I'm like, okay, well, it's not yet. So. <laughs> so, man, so we're getting in this thing and I'm wanting the experience and I want to have this. And so... So, man, all of a sudden, man, it comes down to the place where if you saw the movie, man, it was, you know, they were old, and he's laying next to his wife, and they died, and I just, I squeezed him out. <laughs> and Jody goes, wait, that's not it yet. <laughs> oh, man, I'm sunk, man. <laughs> She's going to think I'm not in compassion. I, w- I was trying to build up to a whale, oh, but it just didn't come. And <laughs> she told me that, and I'm like, oh, no, man. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sunk, brother. You know, God doesn't just want us to um, throw our emotions out there in our spiritual walk and have the right moment to where we... No, he wants us to really, truly understand what we're experiencing. Now, I also saw in this movie this time, and this is kind of where I was going to. I don't know how I got off the track on the other one. But in this movie, the one line that I just love. I mean, you know, dude, sometimes, you know, those... Especially in a guy movie, man, they, they say something like, oh... That's it, man. He, oh, yeah, he's fixing to get bad. He's going to break out bad now. It's going to be ugly. You know, so he walks in. He's got his case of ammunition and gun. Man, he walks up in there in the guy's house. He's going to put his watch in, you know, and he walks in. This man's a Christian, you know, and he goes, you know, the Bible said he knew. He didn't ask him. He knew he had evil on his mind. He was about to destroy those who were doing evil, and he was going to be the one to do it. And, man, he walked in, and this guy, this old man looked at him, and he goes, he goes, you know, the Bible says, you know, we must forgive our enemies. And here comes the line. And the guy looked at him and he said, forgiveness is between them and God. It's my job to arrange the meeting. <laughs> Man, that was awesome. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you, you know, I can't do much for you today, but it's my job to arrange the meeting. Because <laughs> if you need healing today, you know, it's my job to arrange the meeting. You know, if you need deliverance today, if you need prosperity, if you need hope today, it's my job to arrange the meeting because it's between you and God. You understand? That, that's really what we're talking about. The, it's not just an emotional time or, ooh, we cry. It's about God. Amen. It's about you having an experience with God. Whether you cry or don't cry, I don't care. Fall out, I don't care. Just get in. Just get in. We need to mature as, as men and women in our faith, no matter how long you've been saved, whether it was last week, yesterday, 10 minutes ago, we need to become sons. We need to develop into that, into that place. Now, it says here in verse 14, chapter 8 of Romans, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Amen. Do you see that in your Bible? There's a lot written before that and after that. But what I want to focus on for today, the introduction for this month, of living the redeemed life is maturing. It's becoming sons of God. Now, I'm not speaking just to men. Not a men's meeting. This is a church service. That means, understand, it's not a designation of gender here. It's a maturity. It's a statement of maturity and covenant faith. And so we're going to be talking about that aspect of it. So here, he says, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons. Now, how many of you believe, we talked about Jesus a while ago, how many of you believe that Jesus was 100% led by the Spirit of God? 
He said in his own admission, he said, I do nothing of myself, but the things that are being done, I'm speaking the Father's word, and he's doing the works in John 14. Right? And so Jesus was the example of being led by the Spirit because there was results when you're led by the Spirit. Not by your doctrine, not by what you think, but by the Spirit of God. Well, you've got to have some uh, element of understanding. Now, how many of you understand what I'm saying right now? You, you as an immature, when we're immature, we're children of God. You are going to heaven. You are on the pathway. When your life is over, if you continue your course, you're going to wind up in heaven. Great. But we don't want to go there immaturely, right? See, God doesn't use the children. He uses the sons. I'm going to say it again. God doesn't use the children. He uses the sons. The children need to be in the process where they can come and grow. All right? Mature. When we come to church, there ought to be an, oper an operation of the Spirit where people can get something and people can see that God is moving. The pastor should be the one just to arrange the meeting. If I'm hearing the Holy Spirit in my spirit and preaching to you, then there ought to be a response. You can respond and get something. Now, what's happened is, in our generation, we just become vessels of just taking it in, taking it in, like we're learning something without an experience. That, that just doesn't work for long. Son, Jesus, when he walked the earth, the, the curse was in full effect, but he never was touched by it. When Jesus walked the earth, demons were just as real as they are today, but he was never affected by it. When you're led by the Spirit, you're going to know the difference, but you've got to grow. You've got to test this thing out. You've got to learn. You've got to study to show yourself approved. So what we do is we help study. So this verse, as many, there's no number there. There's not just a few. There's many, however many. Or led by the Spirit. They have matured and they are called sons of God and God will use them. Now don't raise your hand because I would, you know, I mean, but how many of us want to be used by God? You know, in my heart, I want to be used by God. I want, I want God to be seen, not just in my evangelistic ministry where I hand out my business cards, jet around with my airplane, and preach to millions. No, what, I want to be used by God in my marriage, in raising my children. And being an example of what a Christian is. Of walking into Walmart and being a Christian. Being a son of God without having done. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I hate that super spiritual stuff, man. You know, when people walk around like they're spiritual, but they're not. I mean, that just disgusts me. I, to me, it's just, ugh. Don't try to make yourself look spiritual. That's the worst thing you can do. That's immature. You're either spiritual or you're not. And if you're spiritual, everybody's going to know it. All right, you with me. Sons of God is a mature level, all right? You've not received the adoption, received the spirit of, a, of bondage again unto fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. See, it's when, it's when it becomes personal. It's whenever you're maturing to the place where it, my, my relationship starts out. I don't know about you, but my relationship with God started out like this. I mean, okay, they said that, you know, I'm going to go to hell when I die if I don't accept Christ. Well, I don't want to go to hell. I don't know what hell is like. I don't know what heaven's like. But it just seems to me like if one of them burning and the other one's got streets of gold, I want to go to the other. And I kind of like nice things. I don't know about you, man, but I kind of like stuff like that. You know what I mean? You know, I, <laughs> that's just me, okay? I just made a choice. But my relationship was still to God like he, okay, God's my father, but I want to hide from him, you know. Because every time I do something wrong, I'm looking for that boot to drop. Kind of, you know, wherever. And, and, and really, you know, it wasn't a material, but it was, it's this here, Paul is describing a relationship where he's my daddy. The word Abba Father means daddy father. Abba. Abbas in the, in the Greek and in the, in the Hebrew, in the Arabic. Abbas, father, daddy. It's a personal, it's, you know. When you get to know your daddy, come on now, he's not just a guy that's going to whip you when you do wrong, is he? A daddy spends time with his kids. Are you listening to me? He wants the best for his kids. You know, as a daddy with my children, you know, I, I hope that they far surpass anything I've ever accomplished in life. I really do. I want them with all my heart to excel and to do well. I mean, and, and come on, isn't that a daddy? 
That's more than just bringing a child into the world. That's being involved. That's watching their life. That's helping them. And this is what Paul is describing. He said, listen, man, you have received this spirit of adoption where God brought you in and says, hey, I, I want my best to be exemplified and seen in your life. It's what I want. He's a good daddy. Come on, look at your name and tell him God's a good daddy. He's a good daddy. And he's raising sons. He's raising sons. You know, we talk about we have two daughters and a son, and, and you know, it was very different raising the daughters from the son. You know, we, we were laughing last night. We were, we were out, out to eat and, and talking about how, you know, my daughters would do anything to avoid the belt. Negotiate, you know, set the terms. I mean, talk to me. Don't whip me. You know what I'm saying? Kind of thing. Now, my son, totally different. He's like, just whip me. Get it over with. Let's go. I ain't got time for this, man. I don't want you to talk to me. And so, you know, <laughs> no negotiation. You're going to whip me, whip me. Don't talk about it. Just do it so I can get on with life. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's kind of the way, you know. And, and so, you know, it, and so daddy has to be able to adapt, you know. And so God's that way with us. He just, you know, he's going he's gonna to work with us according to our personality and how we are. To where we understand our relationship with daddy, father. Everything means God's best. It's all for the good. Amen? Now, over in verse 28 of that same chapter, and I'm skipping over a lot of verses. We'll probably fill them in as time goes on throughout this month before today. Verse 28. We introduced it last week. We're going to do a little more with it today. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. Now, the word... Because there, in translation, there's some things that, that it's a great translation, but the, the word for, where it says all things work together for good, kind of gives the impression where religion jumps all over that and says, well, you know, God uses bad things to show you good things. And they will say, well, you know, you know if you never had bad, you wouldn't know good. That kind of stuff is it, it's so wrong. We don't teach our kids by saying, okay, you know, go stick your hand in the fire. I want you to see what fire feels like. That would be evil, wouldn't it? Or, you know, you've done wrong. You're going to have the flu for six weeks. But I want you to know what it's like to be well. You don't appreciate your health. You go have flu for six weeks so you'll know next time. That's not what God does. Come on, somebody. Can you say amen? amen. That's not a good daddy. At all. That's, the, that's not understanding relationship. But you know, I kind of remember thinking that. Because religion taught me that. Religion taught me that, you know, you know I mean, God's so holy, man. He, you, you, any little thing, you're going to get the hammer. It's coming down. And, uh, you know, so I didn't understand the relationship. We're going to talk about the spirit of adoption, but not today. We're going to look at how all things work together for good. Now, that word for is translated from a little Greek word, a little three letter Greek word. And the little three-letter Greek word has to take on the construction of the sentence to be properly translated. Now, back in 1611, when the King James Version was given, it was translated from the Greek and Hebrew into Latin and from the Latin into English. So there was a couple of things that were different. And while it, it, it kind of was never intended to supply the thought that God does bad things, just teaches good things, it was translated with such a, you can kind of take it that way. But the word should have been translated into. Everybody say into. into. Now, because it's, it's what's called, the construction of the sentence is called accusative. And so when that word comes in the context of an accusative, in other words, describing an accusative sentence, it has to be into. It cannot be anything else. The laws of translation will not allow it to be for. It has to be into. Now, in other places, that word can be used as for. And it's fine. It's, it fits with the translation, but not here. So now when you read it, all things work together into good. It describes the journey of life. How many of you understand the curse is still here on this earth? The curse is still trying to dominate even those who have a Bible on their lampstand and go to church every Sunday and pay their tithe. It does not dismiss that the curse is not out there. So this is saying God is letting us know by the Holy Spirit that there are things that are not good that you're going to see in life. 
You're going to encounter things that are not good, but they're not my will, but they're not good. You're going to be in, the, in this life, and you're going to find yourself in areas and times when it's just not good. But here, Paul is saying all things work together into good. How, how many of you know what all things mean? See, all things. You know, there's going to be things that are going to be, you need a comparison. You need to understand how this thing works. And we need a good, clear picture of it. And so, all things work together into good. So what God is saying is, listen, as you grow from a child and mature, you're going to encounter stages in life where immaturity is going to pop up and you're going to have the, the opportunity to fall back on just your old religion or you're going to be able to grow through it. Now, God wants us to grow. Look at your name and tell them, God wants you to grow. All right, now, I need to get through the teaching part because i got some things I want to show you, but all things work together into good. That means that God says, hey, just let me be involved. How do I know that? Because it said, to them that love God, does anybody loves God in here this morning? To them who are called, is anybody called in here this morning? That doesn't mean call to five-fold ministry, that five-fold ministry. That means are you called to be a Christian? Are you called to live life the way that God had intended it to be, even here in 2013 and on forward, however long that may be? Now watch. To them that love God and are called according to his purpose, the word purpose right there is a really interesting word. It means... To be placed in full view. All right? Purpose. God wants to present his church in every generation past, every generation present, every generation forward. God wants to place his church center stage to show forth who he is. Now, the example of a son was Jesus Christ. He's the son. How many of you know the difference? He's the example of what a relationship with daddy father looks like in real time. Now, we have an imagination, and we can imagine that to be all sorts of things, you know, and, and we have done that in the past. But see, he was like the portrait. He was the picture. I want to tell you a little story. There was a guy, how many of you ever heard of Monet, the artist, or Picasso? Or Rembrandt. You know, Monet, when he started out his career in artistry and paintings, his, he became known because of his detailed artistry. He would, when he would paint a picture, the brush strokes, I mean, he would, he would not accept anything that didn't look like. I mean, if you were to compare a photograph of a field, we have photograph, color photograph now, but he was able to capture the essence of that on canvas. He could paint that picture so much, it was, it's like looking at a photograph. You, you know, it wasn't anything about it. it. just He was articulate with detail. He just made everything detailed. And whenever he put his name on that picture, it meant this is the finish. This is it. Everybody say his name. You understand Jesus was the image of the Father for what a son would look like. Jesus was that picture that God said, this is, put the name on him. Every detail, every aspect, everything about it was seen in the life of Jesus Christ. How many of you know Jesus said, I am the way? You want to know about the redeemed life? Jesus is the way. Now watch. Monet, in his latter years, people began to not appreciate his work. Because other artists came up and they, they couldn't, they didn't have the ability to present their paintings in quite, they didn't want to take the time and they just, you know, it was, it was kind of like it, it was good. And so what they did was they sold it for a lesser price. Are you listening to me? You wanted a Monet, buddy, you had to pay the price. You wanted something else, you wanted something, a good little, good little copy, rendition of it, you know. Hey, it's cheaper, but it's not a Monet. How many of you know where I'm going with this? So Monet, wanting to bring his talent to the table and continue to have people appreciate it, but yet they became less and less interested in what he had to offer. And so they began to look for these other cheaper qualities. 
So Monet said, well, it's gotten to where now. How many of you, I mean, if you're an art lover and I'm not, you know, we were in New York and we talked about going to the big art gallery for about 30 seconds. <laughs> and I wouldn't let Jody stop at the front door. <laughs> I was like, no, we're going on. Because I don't appreciate it that much, you know. I mean, he can show me a Picasso, Monet, whatever, I don't care. But what Monet did was he began to realize that he was not going to, that people didn't appreciate his talent. So he began to paint abstract pictures. He became famous again. And see what the world, what the church has done is we've, we've given up the exposure to the original, what it looks like, and we've just settled for a less. You know, and so, so, so the church paints this abstract picture. And what's abstract? See, what people liked about abstract was it gave them the ability to say, well, oh, notice how the colors blended together. I like that. That looks like a shark. No, that looks like a dog. No, that looks like a cow. You know, and so they begin to be able to put their own expression. And that's what religion has done. We've taken the picture that God put his signature on and said, well... And so we look at ourselves, and what we do is we begin to recognize, man, I can never be. How many of you ever heard and probably even said, well, you know, when we mess up, we're like, you know, well, you know, nobody's perfect. But he still is. See, God's not wanting us to be the centerpiece. God wants Christ to still be the one that people see. And that means that people that have the opportunity to preach in the Bible and open up a Bible need to paint the picture right. Regardless of whether we like art or not, it's still the same. And see, I'm in him. And so when something good happens in my life, it's to express him, not me. But what we do is we tend to look at man like, oh, oh, we're going to go here because, man, they, ooh. we get goosebumps there. Man, we need to quit all that stuff. We need the real deal. Amen? That's what we're working on. So we have to do that by faith. Everybody say by faith. So in here, when he said the purpose According to his purpose, the word purpose is in a construction also. Uh, it's called an aorist tense. And we don't have that tense when you're studying English grammar. Aorist tense is only in Greek. And aorist means it's continual. And that's what I was telling you a while ago. Whenever God broke into the natural, whatever he did. How many of you saw God break into the natural when Jesus multiplied the fish and the loaves? How many, of you saw G How many of you saw God break into the natural when Jesus walked on the water? How many of you saw God break into the natural whenever Jesus opened the eyes of the blind? How many of you saw God break into the natural when Jesus healed the ten lepers? How many of you saw God break into the natural whenever Jesus hung on the cross and he said, it is finished? How many of you saw God break into the natural realm? And, and listen, once it was done, it was done. As far as God's concerned, now it's in the natural realm. Now it's available. Now if you're in the natural realm, you have the Christ who walked, the world, who walked on the water. The Christ who was the cloud and the fire. Back there in the Old Testament became the cloud and fire that's in my heart. Christ became that example. Christ became that brush of the Holy Spirit that God is painting to say, your life is going to be a son. Your life is going to mature from a child and going to grow to the place where no weapon formed against you can prosper. How many of you saw when Jesus walked into the crowd and the crowd wanted to stone him, yet he walked out unscathed? How many of you saw that in the scripture? That was God breaking into the natural. Now, let me tell you, when you look at Hebrews chapter 13, one verse and verse 8 of Hebrews 13, and it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, something's wrong today. The painting has become distorted. Preachers, we're painting a picture that we want the image to be, and we're trying to sell it to people. Oh, come on now. And people are buying into it left and right. There's only one that can paint the picture. There's only one that's the real deal, and that's Jesus Christ. He is the son. He, I mean, Luke recorded like this. He said, he waxed strong. He grew from a child into a man, and then God used him. Are you listening? This is what we're talking about. We, we need to focus on things like that, the sons of God. Now, no man's land, for a few minutes, I'm going to put up a, 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 a screenshot for you. We have to let that image be developed in our spirit by faith. All right? Everybody say by faith. So mature faith is what we're after. 
not just immature faith, not just a bunch of rhetoric, not just a bunch of doctrine that we choose to like or dislike. It's what God wants. As a Christian, as a believer, it's what God wants. Now here, as you can see, I have before you, I have a, a shot. No man's land defined by those two areas. You see the two vertical blue lines? On one side, you see two faith. On the other side, you see the past, the natural. I have doctrine right in the middle. I have the indecision area, all right? You never get the answer there. Nothing ever happens from the spiritual into the natural. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Then you have time. In, when you're in faith, time is always now. I may have in the past that I believe I received you see, that's how you get born again. That's how you enter the family of God. That's how you become a child of God. I believe what Jesus did, I received the effect of it today. Why? Because it's eternal. It never stops. He doesn't have to be here for me to see him, to believe him. I believe what the Bible says, and we get born again. Now, that's the first step. That's when you come, become a child of God. But God doesn't want us to stay children forever. He wants us to grow up. And when we grow up, we're going to have no man's land is where all things happen. You understand? All things that are contradicting God's word. It's where man lives in his soul realm. All right? What the soul is, is your mind, emotions, and your will. The, God gave us a soul. The soul is not your spirit that gets born again. The Bible says that you must renew your mind when you become a child of God. You have to start transforming the way you think. You have to start thinking without limitation. You have to start believing that all things are possible with God. You have to start transitioning how your faith is going to work. You can't let it be limited by man. I don't care what you've heard up until the point of your life that you're in right now. It doesn't matter how old or young you are, honey. God is able to deliver, to heal, to set free. Why? Because if he's done it in the past, he'll do it right now. Because he is the same. And so we are the ones that are going to interact. No man's land is when I get hung up in the middle, the soul realm. See, we learn doctrine. Your soul is like a filter. You'll allow in what you want to believe. You'll reject what you don't want to believe. And God will allow you to do that. I said, God will allow you to do that. You can believe any lie you want. You can believe any truth you want. Because in the soul is also this thing called a will. That will is our decision. That's what God gave us as part of his sovereignty. You can choose. Now you can choose whatever you want. All right? And what we've been exposed to is the picture that man has painted of what Jesus looks like today. Because man has become like Monet did. Well, I'm losing my crowd. I'm losing my people. So I just need to paint a different picture. And all of a sudden, we see the image of Christ today, not what God said. We don't see 2 Corinthians 3, 18. We're all beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord and are changed into that same image. We'll stay sick. We'll stay poor. We'll stay needy. We'll stay without. We'll stay suffering. We'll stay struggling. We'll do those things. Why? Because doctrine has captured us in that realm. It makes sense. Your, your soul is where your emotions are, where your logic is, where your reason is. And if it reasons you, preachers know today how to appeal to man's reason. They know how to appeal to man's logic to get a big offering. We need to quit that stuff. This thing is real. There's a relationship with God we need to mature in. No man's land is when you live in that soul realm. My feelings, how I feel. You'll know you're in indecision whenever you're bouncing back and forth when you let the devil say, well, it's your past. How many of you know that James chapter 5 and verse 16 says this? Call for the elders of the church if you're sick. Let them anoint them with oil. Pray the prayer of faith. And they will, in that prayer of faith, the Lord will heal the sick. The word save is subto. It means heal, deliver, set free, unloose, untangle. Are you listening? But it doesn't stop there. It says if they have been, if they have sinned, their sin shall be. People come down to the altar and before they make it to the parking lot, if they didn't get it instantly, they listen to the lie of the devil that says maybe you didn't get it because of this or that. And maybe it is up to that point. 
But you by faith have to engage with, okay, I was prayed for, I responded to God in faith. It's not going to be about me now. Now, when you are tempted to do that sin again, that's when it's going to be a problem. You got to mature. You got to grow. You got to understand God's giving you that chance. When a person starts saying, I won't, I hope so, you know, well, God's appointed time. When is God's appointed time? I believe I receive. What do I receive? What God said. That's transitioning into sonship. That's when we are not just, it's good to have a soul that has a renewed mind and ready to receive truth and understand that, hey, I can do this. I can believe God. I am in Christ. Christ is in me. Are you listening? And that image is what he wants the world to see. That's God's purpose. We're going to have things that are going to challenge that. There's no doubt about it. There's things out there that are scary as all get out. <laughs> but we don't have to live there. Amen. But we've got to mature in faith. We've got to have mature faith because that's what God uses. And so, so we see here that when we start out in our doctrine, if my doctrine is not good, then I need to change it. <laughs> I need to find out what the truth is because... That's the only thing that's going to move you into what God is looking for. There's all kinds of faith out there. Man-made faith. Devil-made faith. Come on now. But there's only one that God responds to, and that's when we believe him. And we move our doctrine is good. It's going to move us into that faith realm. And it's in there where time doesn't matter anymore. I believe I receive. I believe I receive when I pray. I believe I have it. You know, I tell them like this, Jody and I learned this. <laughs> you know, there's been all kinds of needs, and what we've learned to do is over the years, man, I, we've got scripture verses. You know, if, we in, if we're in a financial need, man, I believe I have the finances. I believe I have them. I may not have them materially yet, but see, God said, and when we've learned to respond that way, our financial needs begin to diminish. We kept up with the tithe. We were doing the things we're right, but then all of a sudden we get in no man's land. Well, why didn't we? Well, man, we don't know what to do. Invariably, as we begin to grow, not saying we're there yet, but as we begin to grow, we begin to see God supply that need. may not have been in my time, and it may have been two or three days later, but there it was. Begin to get very specific. So we got scripture. When it concerns health, we got scriptures. When it concerns raising a family, scriptures. When, you, when it concerns whatever area, you understand? Because we don't want to get stuck in no man's land. With just our, well, you know, I believe it. There's people that will believe things to the grave that God's already set them free from. Because they base it on their feeling, on, on this and that happening. And that's a dangerous place to live. It is. You can't live in faith that way. So... Let's talk about faith, and then we'll move, move. Next week, what we're going to do is we're going to move a little bit further into this, but how many of you getting anything out of it so far? All right, you know, it, it doesn't matter how, how much you take in today. I'm here to tell you God's got a life for you that is, it, that's waiting on you, that is above the curse, beyond the curse. Why? Because the Son, Jesus, operated in that realm. He is the way. Amen. And so we have to understand our part is not to get stuck in no man's land. Either move into faith. Now, here's what Jody and I do. When we are with, a, with a, an individual and, and doing our ministry, and that individual has need of, you know, they, they, we know they're stuck. They, they come back to the doctrine, and they'll tell you, well, I believe God, you know, but. And when they put that but there, they went right back to the middle. Because, see, faith doesn't do that. When you're in faith... I, I have it. I may not have it in my hand yet, but I have it. I have it based on the word. That's it. I don't need man to tell me. I don't need a lawyer to tell me. I don't need a, I don't need a doctor. To tell, I don't need anything. God, I've got God's word. I put my ears to what he said. Well, yeah, but I'm reading it. Well, see, that but. Put, put, there you are. Are you listening? Faith moves into that realm and says, I believe I have it now. Bam. Tomorrow happens, I believe I have it now. Bam. Amen. Next day, boom. All right? Led by the Spirit. The Spirit of God operates in that realm of faith. 
And then we allow our, our emotions to not be affected by any of that other stuff. Now, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. We'll, we'll, we'll finish it up for today. Praise team, y'all come on back up. If you don't come up, I'm going to preach till 3 o'clock. <laughs> when I know y'all are up here, I know it's time. I want to read you what faith needs. These are the elements. These are the, the things that faith must have to move out of no man's land. And I'll do more with no man's land in the next week or a couple of weeks, whatever. But I want you to understand, no man's land is not faith. And what Jody and I do is we have a situation where someone is in that middle realm. We'll say, hey, let's get you to the doctor. Let's get you started because doctors can't help some. Amen? But any good doctor worth the salt will tell you he can't heal anything. He can provide some, some getting you back to where the symptoms subside a little bit, but only God can heal. Are you listening to me? Now, a lot of people don't believe that, and that's okay. But see, it's scary when you step out in faith if you don't know that you're in faith. You step out in your doctrine, it's scary. When you're scared, man, don't, don't even think that you're not in, in that realm of faith. You're not. Amen? So what we do is when they're hung up, and we know, and we discern, they're hung up, what we do is we'll, we'll get them out of that as quickly as we can. Not, not, you, you, how many of you understand what I'm telling you? You, you understand? I mean, don't stay there. You know, because a lot of people will let the symptoms go on. They'll get more fear. They'll get more afraid. They'll get more attacked. Their, their mind just, they can't, you know, boom, 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 boom. And all of a sudden, man, they just, and boy, and it, it's a horrible place to be. So we try to, Jody and I know that our job is to get them out of that realm as quickly as possible. Even if that means going, you know, and getting medical help or, or financial help or whatever it may be. Relieve that burden temporarily so we can get you back into faith. We can get you over into the other side, but maybe there's some things that need to be adjusted. Now for us, the first thing that faith must have is confidence. I probably won't get past this one today. Confidence in him, not in myself. I'm going to just quote Hebrews. It says, hold fast the confidence that we have in him. All right? Another one, I'm going to read a couple of them to you. Christ as the son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence in rejoicing and hope firm to the end. Faith cannot operate without confidence just cannot do it. My confidence can't be in me. It can't be in my, my notebooks of learned theology. It can't be in my degrees that I've earned by passing tests and man saying, you did it. It's got to be in Christ. My confidence. When I think about my confidence in him, I do it like this. Has he ever failed one time? Has Jesus Christ ever failed one time? Has he lied one time? Has he not shown and proven himself to be worthy? Has he faltered one time? And that's where my, I begin to build my confidence. I'm like, no, he hasn't. Even when he was challenged to the max, the natural barrier, the natural was there, and everybody's feelings are screaming out. Even the disciples are like, Lord, we don't have enough money to feed all these people. And Jesus said, find the little boy with the sack lunch. He brought him to him and he blessed it. And when he blesses something, it multiplies. Look at your neighbor and tell him, when God blesses you, blessings multiply. You understand? You cannot stop it. God wants to bless you. But you've got to have confidence in him. You've got to know that we're part of his house, the church. He, we are his house that he lives in. And our confidence, we must keep rejoicing till the end of the battle. It doesn't matter how long it lasts. We got to keep our confidence, amen? When you start losing your confidence, no man's land is pulling you back in like a magnet. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Those verses describe, and I got others, but those verses describe how confidence must be an element of faith. It must be. 
What most people do is they have their doctrine of faith and no confidence. You develop confidence by experience. You know, I didn't have very much confidence when I started driving. You know, I've got more confidence today. I've got more experience today driving. I had no confidence when I became a pilot. Big part of my life, man. I mean, commercial pilot, commercial aviation was all I wanted to do. Up until, you know, the natural changed all that. Our, our son got sick and I, I couldn't go to work and, you know, got, wasn't able to take the job, but still flew commercially just for a corporate. But what happened was I had no confidence in flying. I had to build up time, all right, in the cockpit. You know, and then I'd fly a different plane. And man, I'd have to get confidence all over again. You know, confidence. I knew I could fly, but I just had to. I knew I could drive. You know, now I get in the car with, with somebody else, and I don't have confidence. I've never ridden with them before. I heard, you know, about their driving skills, you know. And uh, my confidence level drops quite a bit. It's like, can I drive? <laughs> What makes you think you can drive better than me? Oh, it's not about better. It's about confidence. <laughs> Come on. You know what I'm talking about. Confidence is something that has to develop. And just your faith, you must develop confidence in him. Amen? And then Paul said, we'll talk about these next week, but just to read them since they're already up there. Verse 17 of chapter 1, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom by revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding to be enlightened that you may know the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power that was wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. And it describes the condition of the church as far as God's concern. In Christ... They are far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, every name that's named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. You believe that? Faith must have those elements, and we'll talk about them next week. It must have wisdom. Faith without wisdom is going to get you in trouble every time you'll bounce right back into no man's land. You'll, you'll supply your own wisdom. You'll try to make your wisdom God's wisdom. Are you listening? God's wisdom. There. But it's got to be revealed. There's a difference between sense knowledge and revelation knowledge. You know what sense knowledge is? Sense knowledge is soul knowledge. It's like education. Revelation knowledge is whenever it's lived out by conviction. You know, the way that I know that I'm doing the right thing because, you know, there are feelings involved and all that, but I know based on the Word of God. It's the right thing. Not a whole, you don't even have to know the whole Bible. Just know what His Word says about what you're dealing with. All things work together into good. Why? Because Jesus never failed. You believe that? Now, sense knowledge is different from revelation knowledge because it's based on senses. And I told you, like, the last couple of Wednesday nights, some people like to say, well, you know, all knowledge comes from God. And I said, well, that be the case. Why did he put a tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden? If there wasn't another knowledge you could get, why did he say, don't you get that one? You can get knowledge that's not from God. And it could be good. Are you listening? It could be good. Not that, not that, I mean, listen, the world has, how many of you know the world out there is good things? But they're not necessarily of God. Are you listening? Man can do good things by his knowledge and advancement and his, all of this, but that doesn't mean his knowledge came from God. I mean, just give you, for instance, we, and, and then don't, don't be under condemnation. I just told you that, man, we, we move people quickly into the medical field if we know that they can't. They're not there in their faith. Because things will get worse if you don't. We want to move them out of that realm and into get them some help. Get them some help. Get, the, get things on the right track. Then we'll get them back in faith. Are you listening? But you can't mix the two. You know, 
That's where we get hung up with our, that's what religion has done to us. For instance, you know, if you got a headache, you know, and you take an aspirin, or let's say you got a headache and you pray, and 10 minutes later the headache's still there, so you take an aspirin, then 30 minutes later the headache's gone, well, which one worked? So what we do is, well, you know, God made aspirins. See, that's what we do. And then we begin to humanize God and deify man. And that's dangerous. It, it'll, be, it'll put you in no man's land. What I'm trying to get you to do is understand the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. When you don't know by witness of the Spirit what to do, then the best thing to do is what you can <laughs> until you can get to that place. Oh, you like, come on now. Y'all don't look so sad. You look sad. There you go. That's better. But knowledge. You know, I told somebody a while back, I said, you know, they said, well, you know, God gave doctors knowledge. I said, he did. I said, well, then why is it a proven fact that about 80% of them are atheists? Are you telling me God gives the atheist knowledge? Is that what you're telling me? No, there's a knowledge of good and evil, church. And the church can't live by that one. We've got to live by revelation knowledge. Because when Christ is in you, you're going to hear the voice of the Spirit. And you've got to learn to be led by that. Now, whether we are or not, that's a whole other ballgame. We've got to learn. I'm trying to think of what I can do to make y'all lighten up a little bit. I mean, y'all stand up on your feet. I'm finished. How about that? See, we want our church to mature. We, you remember I told you like the, the line in the movie? Remember the line in the movie? The guy said, you know... God said, the Bible says you forgive your enemies. And he said, hey, forgiveness is between them and God. My job is to arrange the meeting. <laughs> so where I'm at with this is not, you know, listen, we love you, man. We love you with all of our heart. But I'm here to tell you that we see this all the time. For 25 years, Jody and I have been engaged with, with trying to understand how to move from that natural into that, into where I believe God without looking some kind of super spiritual. You know, when you're led by the Spirit, you know, then the Holy Spirit will tell you what the problem is. The problem is, do we want to hear it? See, we, we, without revelation, man can do a lot of things. You know, I'll, I prophesy over thee, brother, that thou shalt be, you know, a child of the hymn, and, and you're going to prosper, and man, your life, you just, just money, just doesn't see gold, just rain it down on you. And she said, amen. <laughs> now, I wish I could say I was telling you that by the Spirit of God, but I'm not. But I know the Word says I do know that. But me to tell you that, that, that's not revelation knowledge. And we get captured by that garbage. How many of you know it is God's will that you prosper, be in help as your soul prosper? Amen? But all this stuff, this made up stuff, and it never comes to pass, at some point you got to go, huh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You follow me? So we, we, we have to get past that stuff because sons of God are led by the Spirit. Now, can I use you as a bad example? Okay. This is not anything to do with him. Everybody say, Brother Patrick, we know that what he's about to say has nothing to do with you. All right. Now, y'all know that. But if there was a problem in his life, if there was something going on in his life, and, and he's praying and he said, man, no, I need to break through. Here's what the Spirit of God would do, led by the Spirit. Sons of God would say, Brother, the Lord says that those magazines that you've got hidden that you don't want her to know that you read and that time you're on pornography and how you treat your wife, that's what the problem is. You understand? That's the Spirit of God. Why? Because it may not be easy to hear, but it'll get you out of a bind because it'll say, oh, God knows where I'm at. But all this stuff we see nowadays, all this, all this flash and show and fluff and stuff, and it's not happening, we've got to develop beyond that. You understand? That you're a man of God, brother. I'm just telling you, you know you are and I know you are. Okay, brother. thanks for letting me use but do you understand what we've been duped by, church? We've got to get out of that. Amen? Come on, give the Lord a praise. I'm going to quit. Thank God.